Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guest today is Mihailis Diamantis, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Iowa. We'll be discussing his article, The Corporate Insanity Defense, which is forthcoming in the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology. I'll add a link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. Mihailis, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's great to be here. Mihailis, I wondered if before we began our discussion about your article, if you could maybe situate the paper in your existing scholarship and in your agenda, what motivated you to, to write in this area and what kind of led you to write a paper with a very intriguing title? Yeah, so this paper is not atypical of the kind of scholarship that I do. I know exactly how the title sounds, and I know how the concept of the corporate insanity defense sounds to people. It sounds like it's not a serious idea. And I agree with that perception. For the most part, I think that corporate insanity, if you're stepping outside of the law and you're thinking about corporations, what they really are, I don't think that it is a concept that has real application to corporations. Nonetheless, I think it is a concept that can give us some useful insights and perspective on corporations. We've had a number of persistent problems in figuring out how to address corporate crime. And what I mean by address here is to do right by victims of corporate crime, to avoid doing what's wrong to corporate stakeholders, and most importantly, to get corporate crime to stop. And in my opinion, our corporate criminal justice system has failed on all three fronts. It's not a new problem. It's a problem that we've been trying to figure out for this century-long history of corporate criminal law. We've got a set of diagnostic tools that we're using right now that scholars focus on. Those tend to be law and economics tools. They tend to treat corporate crime largely as a matter of crime by individual employees within the corporation. But as I've spent some of my work arguing, I just think those tools are inadequate to some of the persistent problems that we are facing. And when you've got a persistent problem and the current tools you're using aren't adequate to address it, I think you want to look to other avenues for inspiration. Now, there's another way to tell the story of corporate crime that deviates from the law and economics focus on individual employees approach. And that's a story, the story that I turn to, the one in which corporations are the problem, where corporations are the criminals, where corporations are the bad. And if you could see me now, you'd see the square quotes, people in the picture. Now, thinking of the problem of corporate crime through this lens with corporations as being the wrongful agents in the story. doesn't mean you have to lose focus on the individuals. And I think we shouldn't lose focus on the individuals. You've got to have both stories running side by side, the individual focus and the corporate focus. The story that I want, the one in which the corporation of the bad people is one that most contemporary scholars flee from. Speaking of corporations as people strikes, a lot of people as being nonsensical. It's associated with politically controversial um, topics like corporate speech and corporate religious liberties. But what I want to do is I want to dive in to this concept of corporations as being people. Corporate person is not only an enabling designation. It's not only a category which gives corporations rights. I think it's also an important category and can be a powerful tool of control. Now, the law already embraces a fiction of corporate personhood. It tells us that we're supposed to pretend that corporations are people. So this is not a story that I'm inventing. It's a story that has been embedded in our legal traditions for centuries. And what I want to ask is I want to ask what happens if, as corporate criminal law scholars, we don't fight this fiction of corporate personhood. Instead, what if we suspend some disbelief for a little while and see where we end up if we end up diving in and treating corporations as people. And it could be that at the end of the story, at the end of the day, you don't like the results or the policies or prescriptions that we arrive at. And that's fine. You've just wasted a few minutes of your time on this flight of fancy. But it may be that at the end of the day, 
after the discussion, after indulging this fiction, you find yourself with actually a sensible policy prescription, one which can solve some of those persistent problems that I am trying to address in corporate criminal law. And what's great about this approach is that if you like the result that you end up, you've already got a path to legal implementation. You've been working the entire time within the parameters the law set out, within the fiction that the law tells you to use, the fictionalizing, personalizing perspective the law tells you to use for corporations. So kind of the way that I approach this paper and the way that I like to approach discussions about corporate sanity is just to request up front that people know that I don't think corporations are really people. I don't think corporations can really be insane, but I think there could be some value to accepting the law's invitation to pretend otherwise. And I think it can be fun to do that. We just end up having at minimum an interesting discussion and hopefully with some useful policy prescriptions. You call for a leaning into the legal fiction of corporate personhood. And as you mentioned, Criminal law has always been a little bit of an odd fit uh, when it comes to non-individuals. Maybe as a matter of background, could you briefly set out what the purpose of the insanity defense in criminal law generally is, who's allowed to raise it, and what purpose does it serve outside of the context of corporate criminal liability? Okay, yeah, this is good. So if I want to use the tool, this ancient tool in criminal justice, which is the insanity defense, I don't want to pervert it just to bring it to the corporate context. I want to draw on the values that are already implicit in the law's recognition of an insanity defense in the first place. Now, now let me just say, I'm using the term insanity for purposes of this discussion and for purposes of the paper in, in a legal sense. I don't like the term. I don't think it's sensitive. I don't think it's an accurate blanket term for the complex of mental health struggles that it covers. But it's the legal term that we have, and it's in that legal sense that I'm going to be using. So I'm going to be using insanity a lot, but and that term, but it's not my preferred term. It's the one the law has given. And so there's a question about, first of all, who typically can raise the insanity defense? And really, historically, any criminal defendant who thinks they can make a case that they satisfy the elements of the legal definition of insanity can raise it to get their suspected criminal misconduct excused so that they ultimately avoid conviction. And historically, it's claimed only by natural person defendants. And it's not claimed nearly enough. In something only like 2% of cases do natural person defendants claim it, though the incidence of mental illness, perhaps culpability of mitigating mental illness among individual criminal defendants is much higher than 2%. So it's underclaimed there. But I'm arguing in the papers that I think that corporations who within the fiction of the law are also people can, under the terms the defense sets up for itself, also claim it. I think they can plainly satisfy the terms of the insanity defense. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Though, to my knowledge, at this point, no corporation has ever raised the insanity defense. Now, what is the purpose of the insanity defense? So typically, as I said, it's raised by individuals and scholars who work on the insanity defense, most often focus on what the insanity defense means for the criminal defendant. And I think that's the right place to start where individuals are concerned. The insanity defense serves as a recognition that sometimes people do wrong, but they have a moral excuse for doing it. For some reason, perhaps a, a defect of reason, a defect of perception or a defect of volition, the person is not criminally or morally responsible for the wrong they've done. And the insanity defense serves as a recognition of that by lifting criminal culpability from them when they satisfy its elements. Now, my focus in this paper, I, I don't think that the notion of corporate moral responsibility makes sense outside of the fiction of the law. So that's not the angle that I take on the insanity defense and in bringing it there. It's not to recognize a deficit of corporate moral responsibility. Rather, I think there's another important purpose that the insanity defense serves, which is one which pays attention to the interest of victims of criminally insane defendants, both past victims and by future victims. I think the minimum that we owe victims of criminally insane 
defendants is to take their suffering seriously. And the best way we can do that is to show a commitment to preventing the kind of suffering that they experienced from occurring, whether to them or to others in the future. Now, protection with respect to a defendant whose insanity drove him to commit crime, what that requires is it requires not punishment, rather it requires treatment. In the individual case, what it requires is not putting a dangerously insane person into a prison context. What that does, it doesn't prevent future victimization, it just relocates it to fellow inmates. Rather, what's needed is to put the defendant into a context, a mental health facility where treatment can be administered and proper precautions taken to mitigate the dangerousness that the defendant, if he continues to pose it, poses to those around him. In the prison context, whatever mental health concerns, issues, drove the defendant to commit the crime in the first place are likely going to worsen. In the mental health facility is the only context where they have the expertise and the training to address and mitigate the problems. In leaning in to the idea of corporate criminal insanity, what would a criminally sane corporation look like? What would a criminally insane corporation look like as a matter of law? And pragmatically, how could those two states be distinguished from each other? I'll define the sane corporations negatively. They're just all the corporations that aren't insane. Now, I have a pretty easy job of characterizing at least at the legal level, what an insane corporation is, because the insanity defense already sets out the elements of what it means to be insane. Under a popular formulation, it means the defendant lacked the substantial capacity to control his conduct. That's called the volitional prong of the insanity defense, or lacked the substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct. And that's often called the cognitive prong. The case for the insanity defense and to describe what they look like for corporations is easiest with respect to the volitional prongs. That's what I'll focus on now, but we can get into the cognitive prong if, if that's of interest. Now, for the cognitive prong, and this is sort of the general approach that I take to translating these personhood concepts to the corporate cases, first, I want to think about what does it mean for individuals. Now, for the volitional prong, the conduct prong, what does it mean for an individual to lack substantial capacity to control his or her conduct? It means that an individual wasn't in control of his or her body or what was going on with his or her body or had an irresistible urge that subverted his or her will and overcame him despite all the effort that he might have put into place to prevent that urge from taking over. So that's kind of roughly what it means to satisfy the volitional prong for individuals. Now, corporations, they don't have bodies. So obviously, whatever it means for a corporation to satisfy the volitional prong is not going to have to do anything with the control a corporation has over its body. But corporations do act. They just don't act through bodies. The law tells us that corporations act through people. They act through individual employees. So what it means for a corporation not to have control over their conduct that a corporation didn't have adequate control or couldn't have had adequate control over its employees, that a corporation made all reasonable effort, just like someone trying to resist an impulse, an urge, an urge to do something wrong will make. The corporation might have implemented reasonable efforts to control, monitor, observe their employees to make sure that they do the right thing. And yet, nonetheless, a rogue employee might have prevailed in some villainous enterprise anyway. Now, under the law's perception of what it means for a corporation to act under the law's perspective, the corporation acted through the rogue. But if, as I'm suggesting, the corporation had in place already mechanisms designed, reasonably designed, to control the employee, and the rogue nonetheless prevailed in committing some kind of crime, that seems like a straightforward case of a corporation that couldn't adequately control, lack the substantial capacity to control its conduct, at least as regards that individual employee, that rogue employee and the conduct that he carried out. Now, there's another part to your question of how that's sort of great theory, and maybe that's a nice story, but how as a practical matter do we distinguish the sane corporation from the insane one? How do we identify what 
an insane corporation, corporation is. So again, f- focusing on this volitional prong of a corporation who fails to have the substantial, lacks the substantial capacity to control its, its rogue employee, you know, as with individuals, I think that it's a difficult, pragmatic question, especially for lay people to identify an insane corporation as it is for them to identify an individual who lacked the substantial capacity for control. One key input to the inquiry is going to be expertise. In the case of individuals, it's mental health experts. In the case of corporations, it's not mental health experts. But experts on, again, there is scare quotes here, corporate psychology about the systems and compliance regimes that guide and shape corporate conduct in the same way that an individual's mental mechanisms shape and guide their conduct. So it's a difficult question to ask in the abstract because I think it requires an injection of expertise. Ultimately, it's a question for the jury. So the insanity defense is not a diagnosis. Insanity is not a medical term, at least as used by the law. It's a legal and moral term. And so the jury, the fact finders, whoever that happens to be, have to make a determination in morality and law about whether the person, the defendant, whether it's an individual or a corporation, lacked the relevant substantial capacity to control his or her conduct. And if that lack of substantial capacity mitigates their responsibility for what they did. If we were to have this system in which the rogue employee could uh, enable perhaps a corporation to raise an insanity defense, what changes would we expect that to have in the way that corporate criminal enforcement works? What impacts would we see on the deterrence value of of criminal law as it regards corporations? And what impacts might we see with corporate compliance? Would it be an improvement over the status quo or would there be a reduction in compliance and deterrence? And what about the impacts on potential victims of corporate wrongdoing? Uh, Oftentimes, these crimes might be victimless or the corporation itself might be the de facto victim, but we can imagine in the case of environmental or other violations that there are natural person victims who are external to the company. What impacts might this have on them and their ability to obtain justice? I think all of these questions are bound up with each other. So I think the central project of corporate criminal law is to prevent corporate crime. Now, that is the most direct impact that I think, and the most important impact that I think corporate criminal law can have on victims. Currently, under the law and economics framework that we use for theorizing corporate criminal law is an over-focus on corporate deterrence. Now, it's a focus on corporate deterrence that I think is not borne out by either the logic of corporate decision-making or in the economic data we have about the impact of efforts at deterring corporate criminal conduct. Just sort of very basically, we're trying to deter corporations by largely by, by fining them or threatening the corporation with various types of burdens. But in order to deter corporate misconduct, you have to be able to influence the individuals who are engaging in misconduct on the corporation's behalf. And the logic of deterrence requires that you impose the burden on the person whose incentives you're trying to alter. And so by imposing a burden on the corporation, you're hitting the wrong person. So I don't think we're getting corporate deterrence. I think the data bears me out. The corporate deterrence just doesn't work. You increase the magnitude of the penalty on a corporation and you don't get a corresponding increase in prevention of corporate crime. What I prefer and what I hope the insanity to corporate insanity defense helps accomplish both in scholarship and in law is a, is a shift of focus from deterrence to increasingly focusing on corporate compliance as the sole way to prevent corporate crime. Now, there's a worry that arises uh, that perhaps the insanity defense could be perverted, could be utilized by corporations to undermine whatever deterrence corporate criminal law is already providing. 
perhaps corporations might take steps to render themselves insane so they can commit crime and then have an excuse and avoid criminal law penalties. And I think that's a genuine concern. If the corporate insanity defense allowed that kind of gamesmanship, I think it would undermine the preventive goal of corporate criminal law. But fortunately, the insanity defense has already contemplated this. You have the same worry about individuals, about individuals trying to steal their nerves or get themselves to be temporarily insane so they can carry out some criminal project and then receive an excuse on the back end in the criminal justice system. This is how a lot of people think about voluntary intoxication. If you voluntarily intoxicate yourself, you don't get a insanity defense because the insanity defense does not apply to mental conditions that were purposely induced. And I think it'd be the same for corporations. So again, just taking this subdoctrine of the insanity defense from individuals and applying it to the corporate context, it would exclude corporations who attempted to use the insanity defense as a sword, as a way to purposely insulate themselves from criminal misconduct. A purposely induced condition is not one that qualifies for the insanity defense. So in terms of deterrence, I think the corporate insanity defense is a wash because we're not getting deterrence in corporate criminal law as it is. In terms of prevention, here I think is where the insanity defense can really do some work for corporate criminal law by preventing corporate recidivism because it treats corporations rather than trying to deter corporations. And that I think is ultimately what's best for victims. So we've talked about some of the philosophical, some of the doctrinal, and some of the pragmatic foundations or considerations or even potentially issues behind this idea of a corporate insanity defense. And I wonder if maybe we could close with a more threshold pragmatic question, which is, do you think corporate defendants that find themselves facing criminal liability would use this defense? Why might they decide to use it? And why might they decide not to use it and to take their chances or to settle with a criminal prosecutor. If nobody wants to use the insanity defense, then there's no point in writing this paper, right? And initially, it seems like the insanity defense is going to be very unappealing for corporations to claim, just as it is many individual defendants. As I said at the start, the insanity defense is underclaimed by individual criminal defendants. Part of that has to do with the stigma, which is a associated with mental disorder. Now, the optics, sort of thinking from the PR perspective for corporations of claiming the insanity defense are also not good. I mean, it's not that much better from a PR perspective, you might think, to have your corporation declared insane as opposed to having it declared criminal. Now, why might corporations claim it nonetheless, despite the bad optics? I think there are a couple of reasons. One thing to note is that the corporate insanity defense has, as at least the conduct prong of it, has some similarity to a type of defense that other scholars have argued for, which is a reasonable compliance defense. That is where a corporation would get a defense to criminal charges if they had implemented reasonable and adequate compliance mechanisms ahead of time and nonetheless ended up engaging in some kind of misconduct. The thought being what we ultimately want to do is incentivize corporations to have these kinds of compliance mechanisms, so provide them a defense. Now, scholars have been advocating for that. It seems like a very attractive sort of defense for corporations to have. We have compliance. We ended up committing a crime regardless because of something we couldn't foresee or because of some individual rogue. Now, give us a criminal justice defense. Now, it seems very intuitive that corporations would want to claim that sort of defense. It should seem equally intuitive then that corporations would want to claim the insanity defense. All that's happened is it's been rebranded. Now, the benefit of rebranding it this way for purposes of corporate criminal law scholarship is there's already an insanity defense in the criminal law. So this is something we can actually bring and enact tomorrow. Whereas the compliance defense has been something which has been advocated for decades and has not yet seen a lot of traction, at least so far as legal doctrine is concerned. Another benefit to claiming the insanity defense for corporations is it gives them some leverage to 
push back against prosecutors? Is it a lot of leverage? Well, that depends. And we'd have to see how it plays out, but at least gives them some leg to stand on. Right now, the law is flatly against them. When they end up engaging in misconduct as a product of a rogue employee's actions, they just, they lose. They go to trial. The doctrine is against them. But now if they can claim this defense, they have a legal leg to stand on in negotiations with prosecutors about whether and what charges to bring. If the prosecution chooses to force things to trial, then the corporation has the option of raising this kind of defense. Now, as to optics, right, I think that there's some reason to think that insanity is a better designation in PR terms than criminality. Insanity bears with it its own kind of social stigma. It's a stigma which mental health advocates have been fighting for a long time to alleviate. But criminality carries a bigger stigma because it brings with it a sense of social moral judgment and condemnation. One important thing about insanity, about the sort of organizational defects which correlate to what I'm calling corporate insanity, is that the kind of thing that can be fixed, or the kind of thing that can be treated. And so setting up an organization not as a moral monster, which I think is what conviction, criminal conviction signifies and communicates, but instead as being in need of treatment, sets up the possibility of an open path forward, of a path in which the corporation receives that treatment and is fixed and ready to become a healthy and productive member of the economy and society. Mihailis, what key takeaways would you like listeners to have from this article and from this conversation? Well, I think there are a lot of people who are, I'm not going to persuade, I, I, I'm not going to persuade most people that corporate insanity is a concept that needs to be taken seriously. If there were one thing that I wanted people to take away from this paper, even if they don't end up buying into the doctrine, final proposals, or end up buying into the policy suggestions, or buying into the sort of conceptual perspective that I think can be um, a provocation to imagination in solving some problems in corporate criminal law. I think of nothing else, what I'd like people to take away from this is a disposition to focus on the importance of mental health broadly understood in corporate crime. Now, to some extent, the kind of mental health that I'm talking about really just is mental health in the traditional sense, mental health of individuals operating within corporations. There's a reason that corporations are behaving like psychopaths in a lot of contexts, or behaving like analogous to mentally ill participants in the economy and in the and in society. One of those reasons is that corporations act through individuals. And as it turns out, there's a very high prevalence of undiagnosed and unrecognized mental illness among individuals within corporations. I think we need to abandon the mistaken belief that corporate elites are coolly rational and calculating, invincible, and have no mental health problems. It's not only a belief that we as a society might have, it's a belief that these individuals running corporations have among themselves. As a matter of statistical fact, the incidence of psychopathy and other personality disorders among corporate elites, managers, and up is 10 times what it is in the general population. And just because we tell ourselves that it doesn't exist or that if it does exist, these individuals have access to afford treatment for it, doesn't mean that they're getting the treatment they need or that they recognize the need for treatment. I think it should worry us that people with dangerous and diagnosable mental health disorders, what into the business ethics literature they call corporate psychopaths, are in charge of many of our largest businesses. That's one takeaway that I'd like people to have. The other thing I'd like people to take away, the second thing, under this kind of scare coach broad concept of mental health in corporate crime is the corporate analog of these mental health questions for 
individuals, more serious, a double down focus on the role of corporate systems in the production of corporate misconduct and the role the criminal law can play in not only recognizing the importance of these systems, but also recognizing that sometimes the best way to address these corporate defects is not through punishment, as traditionally in criminal law and especially in corporate criminal law, we think about the natural consequence of corporate suspected misconduct, but perhaps focusing instead on treatment and in some cases, compulsory treatment as the best solution to the problems we face in corporate criminal law. Our guest today has been Mihailis Diamantis, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Iowa. We've discussed his article, The Corporate Insanity Defense, which is forthcoming in the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology. I'll have a link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. Mihailis, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you very much, Andrew. This is a pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings.